So I'd like to welcome Earl K6GPB. So Earl was first licensed in July of 1954 as KN6GPB, and within one year he upgraded to his current call of K6GPB. He attributes his interest in amateur radio from his father, who was first licensed in the 1930s as W6KCL. For you chemists out there, that's potassium chloride. And so he was... He, wa his ha he was a ham, and that enabled him to become a radio man in the Navy. And after his, after his retirement from the Navy, he worked for the city of Auburn for, as, a, as a police and fire radio dispatcher. And so he, uh, so he was hired by the police chief because he could talk over the radio. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he worked for the city and other places in government. So he currently holds an amateur extra license with code. And he took the written examinations at the FCC office in San Francisco. He also holds the radio telegraph license with ship radar endorsement as well as a growl. And tonight he will be giving us a presentation on crystals. And without further ado, I will hand the microphone over to Earl. Hey, Jim. We have a question, by the way, coming through on Zoom. They'd like to know, Earl, uh, how many years have you been an SFARC member? As old as the club? Are you one of the founding members? Well, that's worth a mention right there. There we go. Okay, the reason I, I've uh, asked to be uh, making this uh, presentation is uh, several meetings ago, uh, Jim, uh, WA8MPA, had a uh, presentation on uh, capacitors. And uh, seeing the variety, I th have on hand at home a bunch of uh, crystal holders that uh, were of various shapes, sizes. And I thought, well, that might be interesting to show off to the club here. So I probably uh, realize that there are some hams here who are not uh, familiar with uh, crystals, although uh, mo most likely their equipment has some. So I'll uh, give us an example here of uh, what I'm talking about uh, in crystals. Uh, back when I was uh, interested in uh, ham radio and wanted to take my license, I uh, studied the uh, license manual that was put out by ARRL, and I copied a page here from the uh, manual that I studied. And you look on uh, question, or on uh, item number nine, and it talks about uh, what uh, method is uh, required by the FCC for frequency control of a novice transmitter. And the answer is that it's uh, got to be crystal controlled. Uh, well, uh, what are these uh, things called crystals? Well, to give you maybe a little bit more background on uh, uh, exactly what it took for a person to uh, become crystal controlled, I think uh, here's an example of um, a uh, transmitter kit that uh, I had. Uh, and see, the cost on it was uh, $29.95. But uh, this transmitter couldn't uh, really operate just uh, as is there. And uh, back in 1954, $29.95 was a lot of hard work for a kid to uh, uh, come for to uh, get on the air. So uh, what was lacking, uh, which would go into the left-hand corner of that rig, was a uh, crystal. And you see down at the uh, bottom right-hand corner, the uh, crystal. Um, and you see the cost on that is about 10% of what that uh, transmitter costs. But uh, you can only be on one frequency. Uh, you, and so uh, consequently, if uh, you wanted to uh, move around on the band, you're going to have to get a number of these things. Well, it didn't take very long to uh, start spending money that uh, almost equals the cost or costs more than what your transmitter costs. Uh, 
Nowadays, uh, we all think of a VFO to be able to shift on any frequency we want, but uh, at that time, uh, you only had uh, one to play with there. Uh, well, exactly what do crystals do or how they work? Well, back up a little bit to uh, uh, electrical generation. And uh, this is from a, a Navy training series that I, that I had when uh, I was in the Navy and we and I was at A school and talk about electric uh, generation, uh, how to make electricity. And I'll, I'll go through the six ways they taught us here. Uh, the first one was uh, uh, something I think we're all familiar with, is static electricity, where you uh, use like a uh, uh, hard rubber rod and a, a, a cat fur or some type, and uh, you rub it and uh, you generate electricity. This is not too much of a practical way for electrical generation, but it is one of six ways. Uh, another way is uh, through heat where uh, you have two dissimilar metals that are together. Uh, you heat them up and uh, electricity is uh, produced. The uh, third way, which is uh, familiar nowadays, is the photo and uh, through light you uh, generate electricity. Uh, fourth way, another way that we're familiar with is a chemical means of generating electricity. You have two dissimilar electrodes and uh, put it into a uh, electrolyte and uh, you have electric uh, generation that way. And we're familiar with them, and of course, in cells and in batteries. Uh, fifth way is uh, by magnetism. And uh, that I think uh, we're pretty well familiar with is that's one of the major ways that uh, we use nowadays. And then the last method is through pressure. I uh, don't think uh, maybe we're all familiar with that one, but uh, what it is, uh, you have uh, a crystal substance, uh, you put pressure on it, it generates electricity, you release the pressure, and, and the electricity flows in the opposite direction. And uh, that's the general way, and of course, with generation of electricity, you also have a way of uh, uh, putting electricity to uh, uh, have things operate. Like a uh, generator, you can put electricity into it and you turn it into a motor. With the uh, crystal, uh, you put electricity on it, and the crystals start vibrating at its uh, 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 resonant uh, uh, frequency. So that's the basic principle of the crystal is... Uh, through pressure, or electricity rather, uh, applied, and uh, that uh, crystal will start uh, uh, generating a frequency. So what does a crystal look like? Uh, this is uh, an exposed view of uh, one, and Jim has uh, one out in the lobby there that uh, uh, you can actually put your hands on it and feel it. But uh, down the lower right-hand corner, you have the actual crystal itself. Uh, down at the bottom left, uh, you see a couple of plates there, and uh, that uh, sandwiches the uh, crystal. And it's uh, put into a holder, which is up at the upper left-hand corner, and uh, the holder and the plates are held into the holder with the uh, spring, and the cover goes on it and, and the screws. And that uh, is basically what your crystal looks like, and with that, you plug it into the equipment that you want to use it on. So uh, how is a crystal in a circuit? Well, uh, in the upper uh, left corner, you see uh, the symbol for it that shows the crystal in the center there with the two plates, and then you have your leads coming out of it. It acts like a series uh, circuit, LC circuit, and uh, the series uh, LC circuit at a resonant frequency uh, has a uh, almost a zero resistance and uh, the uh, 
figure on the right side shows that uh, with the uh, crystal holder, it adds in parallel with that series circuit a, the capaci a capacitance, which in effect then uh, turns that into a uh, parallel circuit, which has a uh, very high uh, impedance or resistance. So the crystal can function for uh, our radio circuits in two ways. Uh, one is uh, by uh, generating a frequency, and these are examples of uh, how a circuit is, or how a crystal is used in a circuit to uh, make the uh, generation of the um, frequency that uh, our rigs will operate on, or, or whatever you're trying to do. In a uh, when it's uh, operating in a uh, series uh, fashion, it's at a very low resistance, and it enables uh, to uh, allow a very sharp frequency to go through a circuit. And here is used as a uh, filter, uh, so that uh, you get a very narrow pass of frequencies to go from one stage to the next. A uh, little bit of history on it. Uh, I can't read the whole thing there standing here, but uh, anyhow, uh, uh, the words uh, come from uh, Greek and German uh, throughout the ages. And around the 1880s was uh, when uh, uh, it was uh, discovered that uh, you can get a uh, generation uh, effect from a crystal. And uh, through time, uh, it was discovered that uh, it could be uh, uh, done uh, with uh, putting a crystal in an uh, electronic circuit with a, uh, with a vacuum tube, and you can get it to uh, uh, oscillate on a frequency that uh, was usable. Uh, going on, uh, this is where amateur radio uh, really came into it, because... Uh, back in around the mid-1920s, that's about 100 years ago, uh, it was uh, discovered that uh, uh, the crystal, of course, being very stable in uh, uh, producing output and having it connected with a uh, vacuum tube, uh, you got pretty good output from it. And vacuum tubes were very expensive then. And uh, by using a crystal, you were able to, uh, say, reduce the number of expensive tubes that you would have to buy. And uh, consequently, uh, crystals became a means that uh, amateurs used at that time to uh, uh, get on a frequency. Uh, then during World War uh, II, uh, the uh, army, uh, figured that when you have communications, you need to have everybody on the same frequency. So in their equipment, uh, they started using uh, crystals. Well, this started a, a manufacturing process in four crystals. Uh, prior to World War II, there were probably uh, maybe 100,000 crystals in use at that time. Uh, during World War II, with uh, uh, the needs of the service, uh, about 10 million crystals were manufactured. So it became very important uh, to uh, enable communications uh, uh, during World War II. Uh, after, well, during that time, uh, crystals were purchased, or, or not purchased, but obtained from uh, basically Brazil. The quartz there was uh, uh, very good for uh, crystals. And, but uh, in the... Uh, 1950s, uh, the um, method of uh, making crystals was uh, perfected, and uh, that uh, brought the uh, uh, capability of uh, making crystals uh, down so you weren't depending on a source from a foreign country. Uh, like I mentioned, there were many crystals made. There Back in uh, the 1940s, 50s, there were probably about over 100 uh, crystal manufacturers. This is an example of them. Today, in the United States, 
of those uh, hundreds that we've had, we have now have zero. Uh, this is an example out of a 1941 handbook of uh, an ad that appeared in the handbooks at that time of uh, crystals that were uh, available for hams. And uh, some of these are on display out in uh, the uh, front there. And of course, the uh, costs that were involved in those crystals range from about uh, three, four dollars up to about twenty dollars. So crystals were very expensive, and you look at the uh, dollar value then, which was uh, quite different than it is today. Uh, this represents uh, uh, quite a healthy cost for ham. Uh, I'd like to um, uh, go through some old catalogs once in a while, and of course from uh, where crystals were available. This was back in the 50s, and uh, this is an ad for crystals, and uh, you can see that they run a few dollars then, and uh, with the uh, war surplus, and that became available. Uh, you could buy maybe 10 of them for uh, 3.95, but uh, you really didn't get your pick of frequency. It's sort of a potluck. And that, that price remained pretty well the same even up to the uh, uh, 1960s there. And I have uh, one there that shows uh, uh, ham crystals from about uh, 3,500 uh, called KCs. Uh, they're now called Hertz, up to around uh, eight, uh, around 8,500 uh, uh, Hertz or KCs. And you ask, well, maybe uh, why would a ham need crystals around eight, uh, eight megacycles or megahertz? And uh, the answer is, uh, uh, if you wanted to go up real high in frequency, you had to. Uh, that use multiplier stages in your rig. Well, with the ones in the eight, to get to two meters, you can use an eight uh, megacycle crystal and multiply it 18 times, and that brings you up to 144. So that's the reason why you see crystals uh, advertised at that time at uh, 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 8,000 KC. And today, uh, cost of crystals, uh, took this out of, uh, uh, off the internet. You can get them for about 20 cents a piece now, uh, uh, little tiny ones. And we have some small ones that are shown out there in the uh, uh, display there. So uh, these are some holder types uh, that are available nowadays if uh, you wanted to purchase uh, crystals uh, similar to uh, what could be used in some of the older rigs. Uh, there is one outfit that uh, does sell them. Uh, and uh, the cost on them are uh, uh, quite expensive, uh, even by today's standards. Uh, you pay probably about $18 for a crystal to be on one frequency. I paid 34 last week. Pay for 34, I, I can believe that. Uh, probably got the frequency that you wanted. Yes. <laughs> you didn't uh, get the pick somebody, from somebody else. Uh, these are some uh, uh, holder types, like I say, are on display there. And if uh, uh, you have some uh, quick questions that uh, uh, maybe could be answered, uh, well, these are still more holders available. i uh, be able to answer those for you. I think I went over my five, ten minutes, whatever I'm allowed, but uh, if there's a quick question, go ahead with it. Thank you. Um, okay. Having been licensed back in 64 as a novice, and uh, so this is bringing, this is very nostalgic for me as well, but, um, you know, working only CW on 40 meters, you had those, just a couple, I had maybe, maybe three crystals that I could move around. Well, you were rich. <laughs> well, they were, uh, they were interesting crystals in that uh, we wanted to form a little net. So back then, of course, you transmitted on one frequency, and then when you called CQ, you would transmit on a frequency, 
when you ended, you'd start tuning up and down the dial because you had no idea where that returning station was going to be. Right. right? So that was, that was the, we don't do that anymore. So that, that took away a lot of fun. But anyway, um, mm -hmm. I'm sure you went through the process. Tell us the process that one would use in order to shift the, uh, the frequency of a crystal. Well, that was always a, a, a fun, chancy uh, process. Uh, you, uh, earlier I showed a uh, slide, or had the uh, holder that was uh, taken apart, and you had all the parts. Well, you take the crystal itself, and what it used was a, a piece of glass, and then you put some uh, cleanser on it, like Bonami or uh, whatever, and a little bit of water, and then you take that crystal, and you start grinding it in figure eight pattern, and you hope in the process you didn't break the crystal. That, uh, to do that, you would uh, raise the frequency of the crystal by making it uh, uh, smaller physically. And to uh, try to raise the crystal, maybe a couple of KCs, you would uh, take a pencil and uh, draw on the crystal on the uh, corners so that uh, it put a little more density into the uh, crystal to lower the frequency. So those were some tricks you tried to do to uh, uh, change frequency. VFO, VFOs were really a, a dream piece of equipment to have after you got your uh, general license. Then you could uh, have a greater uh, area of the band to be able to transmit on. Good question. That's a fun one. Yes. I. It's more of a comment. I don't know if people know. There's a place uh, not far from here, up in Tahoe, called Crystal Peak, and you can go there, and you're allowed to take a five-gallon bucket of crystals from it. It's um, just off of Hennis Pass Road. Um, so in between Verde and um, I'm trying to think, is it Spalding or something back there behind Pr Lake Prosser and all that? But that was a. Uh, World War II military reservation where they mined uh, silica quartz crystals for um, World War II crystal radios. And it's uh, very nearby. So I w I've always thought that'd be a cool place for hams in the hills to go travel and they could bring back crystals and we could file them and um, attach them to LEDs and, you know, make, a, make the LEDs light up. <laughs> very good. <laughs> Appreciate that comment. Okay. Hearing no more, thank you very much. <laughs>